Okay, let's talk about collisions and hit masks and everything that that entails. Uh, in GameMaker and I expect in most game development, there's really only two ways to check collisions. Uh, you know, let's keep this limited to Game Maker. There's really only two ways to check collisions in Game Maker. Uh, the first way is mathematical. Uh, this can be as easy as a point distance, right? If you say uh, bar dist equals point distance x1, y1, x2, y2, presumably like a center point of a circle, and then uh, a point you're looking at, you could say if distance is less than the radius you want to check, right? So like maybe 32 or whatever, then we got a collision, right? Uh, there's lots of ways to do mathematical collision checking, you know, rectangle, uh, you know, there's lots of built-in functions for doing it, like point in rectangle. Uh, point in circle is, uh, is similar, but you can kind of see x, y, x, y, rad, x, y, x, y, rad, basically the exact same thing, right? So instead of this, you could do this. I guarantee you it's the exact same code under the hood. Uh, so there's lots of mathematical ways of checking collision, but you're going to notice pretty quickly that there's a lot of point in shape, right? Very generic shapes, like point in, there we go, circle, rectangle, triangle, there's your basics, right? When things start to get complicated, it's usually because you don't just want to check a point anymore. You want to check two shapes overlapping one another. Uh, and they do have built-in functions for that, like uh, I think it's rectangle in rectangle, rectangle in circle, rectangle in rectangle, rectangle in triangle, and all sorts of combinations like this. Uh, but I'll tell you right now, I almost never use any of those. Uh, the other method for collision detection, okay, I use this one quite a bit, right? Uh, but usually not in the context of I'm checking for a collision between two objects. Uh, these are more like logical checks to determine other things besides hits. Uh, so the other method of collision detection is the one we're all kind of familiar with and identify as collisions, which are sprite collisions, texture collisions, whatever you want to call them. Object-to-object uh, -object collisions using uh, a collision mask, right? Uh, so let's explore collision masks for a second. So let me create a new sprite here. I'm going to say sprite, uh, whatever. You know what? Let's give it a good name. It's called sprite mask. I'm going to edit it real fast. So I am going to make a very noisy. Well, let's ramp this up a little bit. Okay, so we got a little dude right there. Uh, so let's look at our mask options. So right here in our sprite. We have multiple modes and multiple types, tolerances, which ugh, I don't I don't even know if I want to really get into that, but uh, I don't use a slider ever. Uh, so take that pretty well. Uh, so over here in mode, we have automatic, full image, manual, and this is for your mask, this tangular mask here. So uh, if I say manual, then I can come in here and let's see. Come on. Give it to me. There we go. Sorry, manual. I can grab these little handles and I can decide what the mask is for this object. So what is the mask? The mask defines a bounding box on the sprite, uh, on the object that has this collision mask assigned to it, where the two origins line up and we check collisions against that. So if two sprites are overlapping, we check these two rectangles against each other, see if the rectangles are overlapping, that produces a collision or it doesn't using any of this sprite collision function, or, uh, collision functions like place meeting, uh, instance place, uh, position meeting, uh, we'll check a uh, single point for an object sprite mask, uh, and any number of other like there's a few other ones, but those are kind of the main ones. Uh, and so you'll overlap these two sprites. If two objects have the same mask, we overlap the two masks we, at their positions. We see if 
uh, they produce a collision, uh, if the two overlap, then, you know, collision. Uh, there are other kind of uh, uh, mass as well, or types of uh, collisions. Uh, rectangle with rotation. Uh, this means that if I had like, if my mask is like this kind of rectangular, and let's say the, uh, uh, yeah, we can keep it middle center. If I rotate this, it's going to, this point's going to kind of like swing out over here. I mean, here, let's go to Photoshop for this, actually. Let me make a rectangle here. Okay, so let's say this is my normal mask for my rectangle, right? If I take this and I, let's back up for a second. So when you have an object with a mask uh, assigned to it, which we can just assign the sprite, let's do that, boom, got a sprite. If I'm gonna rotate this guy, you know, let's add this to the room real fast so we can test stuff. Let's set up a little draw event. So I'll draw self and then draw. Do I have a function for this? I think I have a, I, I think I have a function for this. Let's see. Helpful scripts. Draw. Ah, I don't anymore. Okay, we'll just do it real fast. Uh, draw a rectangle. Uh, box left, box top, box right. Bottom, true. Okay, so this represents our bounding box. Uh, so when we run this, we're going to be able to see. Oh, right. <laughs> Doesn't like it when I just leave garbage in the uh, create event. So when we run this, we're going to see. Oh, come on. So when we run this, we're going to see our sprite. You know what? Why did I put anything in my creative event? There we go. Now it's happy. OK, so we see our bounding box right there, because that's what we defined over here uh, in Sprite Mask. So we can drag this around, everything like that. Uh, let's go back to rectangle real fast. And that's our bounding box. Your sprite, your, your collision sprite, will always have a bounding box. There's nothing you can do to remove the idea of a bounding box. These, these, these variables on the, uh, on, the, on the object, B box left, B box right, doesn't matter what you pick over in these settings, there's always gonna be a bounding box. So what happens when I uh, rotate this guy, right? Rotation uh, using image angle, uh, like, let's do this. Let's add a step event. Okay. Oh. Okay. So we're going to rotate him uh, half a degree every step. Uh, and let's watch what happens to our bounding box. So notice it's changing sizes, right? So as you rotate things, it's going to take your mask. Uh, and rotate it, but this is your collision mask. For your most basic collisions, non-precise collisions, if, you're, if, you're if your sprite is set to uh, rectangle, that's all you're getting. You are going to get collisions anywhere in this, uh, this box, which doesn't line up well with the, uh, the images it is now. Uh, so let's go fix that real fast just to make the demonstration a little bit clearer. Let's just set it right back to our default. So we got automatic full image. And there we go. So it gets bigger because it's going to be looking like you rotate a rectangle, you know. It's going to get bigger as it rotates. Right, on like a circle or something like that. So uh, we're covering more area, but we're drawing a box around that area, and that's what we're checking collisions against. So it's a way bigger box than you initially intended. And that's not necessarily what you want, and very rarely what people want when they're doing 
uh, when they're rotating their, their rectangle collisions. So there's another option uh, built into GameMaker, which is uh, rectangle with rotation. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's see if I can set up a nice, uh, set up a little tester object. How about that? And we're just going to say draw, draw, if position meeting, else x, else y, object test, draw, let's see, control c, white, control c, green. And uh, I could have done a ternary there, but I don't care. And draw set color, see color, and then draw a circle at R, mouse X, mouse Y, uh, radius of like five. Okay, so we're gonna have a little tester dude in here so that we can actually test collisions and show the differences. Okay. So I've got my little white circle here. I'm gonna so you can see how it's it's not precise, right? I can I can hover over this area where there isn't any color, but the the it's not the bounding box anymore. It's the rotated version of the bounding box, not the pure bounding box. But you'll notice that we still have the same code drawing this drawing this out, the B-box, left B-box, right? So as soon as you get off of like automatic and regular rectangle, so let's run this again with just regular rectangle mode. Now you can see it's responding only to the B-box. Like that's all that matters is the B-box. Uh, so then what we had before, uh, before that was rotated with rectangles where it respects, you know, the actual size of this box and what it looks like when it's rotated rather than just the overall, you know, aligned, uh, rotated giant box as it rotates. Uh, and then there is ellipse, uh, which is basically just a circle, which why not just use point distance because you might want two of these to overlap, and then you want to know if two circles are overlapping. Uh, it says slow over here. Ignore that. Always ignore it. Like all of these guys, they all say slow. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal at all. Uh, so this one works just as about as you'd expect. It's just a circle. So the rotation itself shouldn't change anything, right? Once we're colliding, unless I move the mouse, it shouldn't stop colliding. Uh, so I don't use that one very often, but it's not a bad one. Uh, diamond, I don't really use this. I'm actually not sure if this supports rotation or not. Let's check. Yeah, it looks like it does. So if I just keep this here, the little points of the diamond will just... No? Maybe? Okay, yeah, it's it looks like the diamond is rotating, so that's cool. I've, ne I've never used this one either. Uh, and then there's precise. And precise is pretty cool. Uh, and again, it warns you of being slow, uh, because what will happen is that, so you can see like, this is very precise. So you have to rotate through, boom, there we go. Now we got a collision, no collision, collision. If I could find this point right in the center, you know, there's ways for me to, to not hit that because there's a little hole in there. So what this does is this is comparing our point to literally every single pixel in the 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 sprite in its current rotation and if it finds an overlap then it's going to uh it's going to return true that's why this is slow what happens is if you've if i've got another object that has its own uh mask in fact here let's do this let's uh let's give object tester also a collision mask of this and we'll give it the sprite as well Give it the sprite, uh, and we'll make tester uh, also uh, rotate 
probably shouldn't do this in the draw. It'll rotate a little faster, that's fine. And then we'll just say, uh, if place meeting, so place meeting, we're gonna con compare our mask to that mask, uh, add to our mouse X, mouse Y. Uh, then, you know, actually, uh, let's do this right. Let's add a step event. Okay, so we're gonna rotate. So, and then we're just gonna, actually, let's just do this. We're just gonna update our X equals mouse X and our Y equals mouse Y, so this object follows the mouse. And then in the draw event, we can just say if place meeting X, Y, then, you know, I'm gonna do a turn here on this image, blend equals, if we're colliding, then green, uh, else, uh, black will make it like invisible, kind of like a little shadow of itself. So it won't show up unless uh, we're moused over and colliding. And we shouldn't have to do anything but draw a cell. So let's see what that looks like. Okay, well that's a horrible representation. Let's try again. Uh, let's do C white and C uh, gray, it's just a little dark. Let's see if that helps. So there we go, so it's like, so what's gonna happen is if we were to take this same uh, code over here on object test that draws the bounding box, let's go ahead and put this over on object tester as well. So when we're doing precise collision detection, what GameMaker is going to do is it's it's not going to do precise collision detection for both of these guys right now. It doesn't make any sense. Their bounding boxes, which is a much, much, much faster operation, aren't even overlapping. So it's not going to bother. It's once these two white boxes intersect that it's going to start saying, oh, okay, now we got to check the pixels in the area that these two are overlapping and see if any of them are both populated on both both collision masks. Boom, there we go. So we just got it and we got a collision. So it's very precise, pixel perfect. Uh, they've recently made changes where it's not necessarily whole numbers only. They have some, you can do some floating point comparisons, uh, which I'm not sure if that actually ended up making it easier or harder, but it's better. I'm honestly not sure. Uh, I haven't really played with it much since then. I've kind of moved to a more uh, whole number only system of collision checking uh, that gives me peace of mind, uh, but it's kind of a pain in the ass to maintain. Uh, so, so that's why you know people say precise collision detection is slow. And yeah, if you have a hundred thousand of these on screen and you're doing tons of checks all the time, yeah, it's going to be slow. Uh, but uh, Commandment Thirteen and all that, we don't we don't worry about performance issues until we have performance issues, and then we can reevaluate how we're checking collisions and see if we can make it better. So let's go back. Uh, there's one more mask setting, uh, precise per frame. If you have multiple frames on your mask, then yeah, you can have each one have its own collision mask depending on which frame is being displayed. I don't use this one very often. I use it for precise tile checking and that's about it. Uh, so, uh, Let's do manual real fast again now that we're drawing the boxes and we'll do that little little narrow rectangle guy. And yeah, you can see that it's like, you can only see it when it's rotated up or down really. Uh, I'd have to create another sprite that's that shape to really show what the mask is doing. But you know, it's not perfectly lining up with where the boxes are overlaid. Again, not, not something I usually use too often uh, manual, uh, just because it's a pain in the butt. I don't like maintaining these shapes and coming in here and fiddling with these handles and stuff like that. So nine times out of 10, I'm using automatic, you know, rectangle if it's a really simple thing or rectangle with rotation if it's something I'm gonna be rotating and that's it. Or I'm just gonna do precise uh, if it's any sort of shape other than a rectangle basically. Uh, 
or I guess circle. I don't know if circle is actually any faster. I actually doubt it is. I'd be surprised if these the the real computation behind the scene is any different performance wise on any of these. Uh, so once you get off rectangle, rectangle with rotation, it doesn't really matter what you choose as long as it works for what you want. Okay, so what does this mean? Like, what are we doing with this? Uh, let's build a little demo. Uh, let's get rid of this. This mask is kind of worthless. So let's edit it, uh, select it all. Let's make something more practical. Let's do a uh, just a regular rectangular mask. So I'm going to call this, uh, or I'm going to make this red, and then go back here. I'm going to make it smaller. Let's make it like 16 by uh, 32 by 32. And I'm going to put the origin in the, yeah, we'll keep it middle center for now. So I'm gonna have lots of different masks uh, for a lot of different reasons. And so I like to name them for what they are. So there's a 32 by 32 uh, uh, middle center origin. And then I can reuse this for all sorts of things and knowing the size will help with I'm, when I'm using math to re, re, resize it and scale it, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, and then let's create another sprite. This is going to be my sprite. Uh, let's make this a player. Let's call this our little player dude. He's also going to be 32 by 32. And we're going to make him green. And he is going to be uh, this guy. Let's make this just object player now. And we're going to say uh, sprite player. And the mask is going to be same as Sprite for now. We'll, we'll get to this in a second. So what this does is this sets your, let me add a create event. You have a mask index, and this is basically uh, where, what Sprite are you pointing at? So right now my mask index is same as Sprite. What is that? Technically, it is negative one, which is technically self just a built-in keyword. So when you go to draw mask index, right, what it will do is it'll say, oh, you want to draw a sprite. That sprite's index is uh, stored in mask index. It is currently set to negative one. Since you said draw a sprite negative one, I'm going to go to the object and grab sprite index. This is just under the hood logic. So mask index is just a pointer at what sprite are we using. And if it's negative one, then we're using this sprite. And if it's negative one and there is no sprite here, it's going to blow up at you because you have no sprite, so there's no mask. Uh, so this, a really, really important thing to note is that mask index is not read only. And you can change it rapidly and make many collision checks with it in a, in a single step before, you know, without the player even knowing what's happening. Uh, so that's very useful, and I'll show you how we do that uh, in a minute once we get this kind of test project uh, set up. So part of doing that is you want different hitboxes for different things. So we're going to make a little... Uh, like take a little ship, like make the, make this guy like a little spaceship, right? And he's gonna follow my mouse directly because I'm not gonna build a whole game here. And uh, we're gonna have some walls. So let's create an object, uh, object wall. And we're gonna have some bullets. And bullets are going to let's get a let's get a bullet sprite. And we're just gonna make that like, we're gonna make them pretty big. Uh, so let's make these also 32 by 32, uh, centered in, uh, origin, and we're gonna make a solid, let's make them like bright aqua. Okay, so we got that. And then we're going to do our collision mask as, uh, I mean, you might as well use ellipse. You can see it's not perfect. It's you know a mathematical ellipse, so it's not going to line up perfectly with your 
uh, thing, but it'll be good enough. So we'll leave that there. And let's get our object bullet, sign that there. And then we got our walls. Uh, so object bullets, we're gonna have a little bullet spawner. So here's what we're gonna do. The room is gonna have our player. It's going to have, let's get rid of object test for now. We're gonna have some walls, which I'm just gonna make red. So let's get some walls in here. And it doesn't really matter. And then we got our player. And then uh, let's do a couple other things. So uh, let's create another sprite. And we're gonna call this sprite uh, player world, uh, world collision. And we're gonna make it like 16 by 16 and centered. And we're going to make it, let's see, I don't know, like yellow or something. And then create sprite. Now, if this were like a bullet hell game, often what we'll see is uh, uh, you have to hit the very center. Like the player has a lot of leeway. Their, their collision is a lot smaller than the ship looks. Uh, this makes it easier to dodge bullets and kind of squeeze between two bullets in a uh, pattern, uh, bullet pattern. So uh, it makes the player play carefully, but more carefully than they really need to. And expert players in a bullet hell you know, know the limits and how big their actual collision checking is for bullets, and they can exploit that. So we're going to say sprite player bullet uh, collision is... four by four, and we're gonna make this like orange or something. Salmon, something like that. Okay, so we've got all these different collisions, and now we need to keep track of, uh, we need to check collisions, keep track of which ones uh, we are responding to, uh, and uh, kind of explore what that means. So let's make this object bullet spawner. This guy's just gonna spawn bullets around the room at us. Uh, I'm not gonna do anything too fancy. So uh, create arm zero equals 60. Let's spawn one a second. That might be ex excessive, but we'll see. Excuse me. Uh, X equals. Uh, actually, let's do this. Choose zero or one. Uh, switch. So this code is going to pick the number zero or one. And we're going to do one of two things. We're either going to spawn a bullet on the top or bottom edge, or we're going to spawn a bullet on the left or right edge. And either way, the bullet's just going to go towards the middle of the screen. So var x equals uh, choose 0 or negative 10. Yeah, let's just do 0. Who cares? 0 or room width. And then var y equals uh, i random room height. And then we're going to do the op. No, let's get a break in there. And we're going to do the opposite for the other case, which is 0 room height and room width. So again, this is going to choose between 0 and 1, and all that's going to do is pick one of these, or you know, pick one of these two cases. In the case it chooses 0, we're going to pick uh, either the left or the right side uh, of, the, of the screen, and then somewhere between the top and the bottom. So it could be at the very top, it could be in the middle, it could be at the very bottom, it could be anywhere in between the top and the bottom on either side, and that's what this chooses for. And then we do the opposite. We're going to choose either zero or room height, which is the the top of the screen or the bottom of the screen, and anywhere along, you know, the width. So then we can spawn a bolt there. Eight layer x uh, depth. I almost never use layer depth x y depth. Oh, these are. 
x underscore y depth uh, object bullet and we don't need to use that last argument because the bullet's going to take care of itself so what's the bullet going to do it's going to create and it's going to say uh, direction equals point direction room width divided by two room height divided by two uh, x y Okay, so it's just going to move towards the center of the room from where it was spawned. Uh, and its speed is going to be pretty slow. We want to see, we want to see this guy moving. Uh, and then we'll add an event, other, outside room, just clean them up. Okay. So let's go into the room. Let's add our bullet spawner. Let's see what we broke along the way. Make sure a little demo app works. Object test. All right. Okay, we're just gonna go back to not changing the image blend. Okay, so now we got bolts coming in, and we're not like checking for collision or anything. So, are we gonna get anything from the right side or the top or the bottom or? There we go, there's the right side. Anything from the top? Oh, that almost worked. So, little problem in my logic. Let's go do that real fast. Choose zero room width and zero room height. Oh, no, you can't do that. It has to be Y and X. That should do it. There we go. Now we're getting them from all sides. Except for the right side. Come on. There we go. Okay. So we got bullets streaming in, but we're not really doing anything with the collision. So what we want to do is I'm going to stop this guy from rotating because uh, ultimately rotating your collision masks, uh, especially like on your players, is a pain. Uh, and, uh, so if you're playing like, I don't know, like a game where you control like a battleship or like a giant long, like a submarine, something that's long and skinny and you kind of have to rotate or a car, uh, you have to be really careful about rotation because you need to say, oh, I'm going to rotate, see if I collide. And if I collide, unrotate, and then, you know, that was a collision, uh, but I don't want to be stuck in the wall. So just like moving X and Y, you know, when we do standard collision check, we say, hey, move the guy to this X and Y. Is there a wall there? Then don't go there and then respond to it accordingly. You have to do the same thing with rotation. So we're not going to do that. We don't need our, uh, our player to rotate in this particular example. So I'm going to stop that. Uh, and what is our player mask? Our player mask by default is should just be a standard automatic rectangle. Perfect. Uh, so we don't really need to draw his box anymore either okay so let's how are we going to keep track of of what we are colliding with right we want to know if we're colliding with walls we want to know if we're colliding with bullets uh, and uh, I guess that's it I guess that's all we've got right now so we need to keep, get two variables uh, wall collision equals faults and bullet collision equals false. So to do this, we're gonna go into the step event and we're gonna do some collision checking. Uh, and what's cool about this is we can, as I said earlier, swap the mask rapidly, do different collision checks for different things, swap the mask, do more collision checks, swap the mask, and then come back. So in this way, we can say, hey, when I'm checking for collisions with object wall, uh, so if place meeting uh, x, y, object, wall, then well, I guess we could just do this really easily. We could just say wall collision equals place meeting object, wall. And then we could say uh, bullet collision equals place meeting x, y, object, bullet. Let's just start with this. Let's just start with this. Uh, 
because this will this will illustrate it well, I think. Uh, so we need to get this on screen somehow that we're colliding with these guys. So I'm just going to draw some text out. Self, draw text, and go x y plus you know thirty two or whatever, and then string is wall. Let's equals. Uh, we're gonna do a little ternary here. Uh, wall collision. True. Else. False. And then we're gonna uh, let's do this like this on multiple lines. And then we're gonna add a. Let's close that off. Add a new line. And add that and say bullet equals or plus uh, if bullet collision and true else false. Okay, there we go. Okay, so let's test this real fast. There we go. Wall is setting to true. And, you know, we can just barely graze a bullet and bullet gets set to true, right? It's just like barely touching it. And that would suck, right? In, in a bullet hell game, you want to be able to weave between these guys. And there's no way you're doing that when your mask is your entire sprite. Uh, and even hitting the walls, it's a little, it's a little finicky, right? So... So let's do this. Let's go into our draw event, say draw self, and then we're gonna say uh, draw sprite. Uh, let's do the sprite uh, player world collision first because that's smaller than our default sprite but and bigger than our bullet collision. So zero, x, y, do that again, but with bullet collision. Wow, I called it world collision, right? Uh, world collision. And then this will be bullet collision. So now we can run that and see, see our different collision masks. Like right now we're not respecting them, right? Like wall should be only intersecting yellow. Bullet should only be intersecting the tiny orange in the very center of that. And it's not working. So how easy is it to, the, to get this working? Super easy. So if I say... Uh, wall collision, bullet collision, all I have to do is say mask index equals uh, sprite wall collision, sprite player world collision, there we go. And then I can change it again right here. Uh, player bullet collision. And then I can even change it back. Self, negative one, self, it doesn't matter. Same as sprite. It really doesn't matter because we're we're managing our mask index for every collision detection, uh, collision check we're doing. So setting it back to index doesn't matter because the next time we use mask index, we're going to be back in the step event again and setting it to player world collision. But you could always set it back to self if you need to. Uh, uh, in fact, like, no, there's really not a reason to. Uh, at least not in this demo. So was that really all we needed? Let's see. So now I can partially overlap with the wall and it says wall equals false. But as soon as that goes over, now we're wall equals true. Well, what about bullets? This is gonna be a little bit more finicky. But you can see I, I really have to be overlapping the bullet a lot for it to actually register as true. So in this way, you can have different hitboxes for different collision checks on your player itself just by adjusting the mask. Uh, what's kind of cool about this is say you're making a platformer and uh, your wall collision is not your entire sprite at all. Maybe you just have like a check on their feet, right? That, so we can go to the player uh, world collision. And there's a number of ways we can do this. But let's do it, edit image. Let me just get rid of a whole bunch of this. Boom, just get rid of that. And now we just have a strip at the bottom of the sprite. 
the origin is still going to line up with our sprite, but it's just going to be along the bottom. Uh, and we go to our collision mask, we say automatic rectangle, and it's already determined that this area is all that needs to be uh, considered as part of the mask. So if I run this again, our wall collision now is going to be offset from, from the player sprite itself, right? It's just along this bottom edge. So you can create a sprite and you know change the origin like I can drag this way over here and you know now it's only true when that thing way over there is hitting it so you can get pretty funky if you need to uh, but typically you do this mask index swap thing when you want them to stay lined up right you've got your player you want to check whether something's colliding with it in multiple different ways so you just swap the mask out, keep them pretty much lined up with the object, uh, and that's the idea. You don't want to be messing with origins to try and push things all the way to the left or the right. So I recommend keeping your origins lined up. So what if you do want to check a collision in a direction different from you uh, in like an offensive way, right? This is good for defense. I'm checking... Am I colliding with a wall? Am I colliding with a bullet? Am I colliding with something else? But now I want to go out and say, you know what? I want to hit these bullets. I want to clear them out and, and like do like a shield or a like maybe a sweeping attack that like sweeps around me and clears all the bullets out. So this is uh, another type of collision check, sort of. So let me explain. Let's bring this guy back real fast because it's good. Okay. So right now we've been, you know, we've got our player and he's checking for collisions for himself. But when I'm like creating a, uh, a melee attack or a laser or something like that, I don't want my player to, to be doing those collision checks because I'd have to modify his mask sometimes, you know, uh, doing all sorts of weird calculations and resetting it. Could I do it with just my player? Yeah, but it's kind of annoying. So I'd rather have an object that is dedicated to performing collision checks for me and then returning the results, and then the player can do with that what they will. So let's say I have this, like, say this character is capable of creating a sword that's kind of like a Radiant Silver Gun. It's an old game, but... It's a top-down shooter. You got a little sword weapon, and it spins around you and attacks enemies around you. In this case, it's going to attack bullets, though. So let's add a way to do that. We'll just say if keyboard check pressed, ek space, then we are going to create an instance of... Uh, I, I normally play like an attack animation and stuff, but right now we're just going to create an instance of... Uh, actually, no, let's see. We're going to just call this a function. So we're just going to say swipe uh, bullets. We're going to start our bullet swiping. Back here, swipe bullets equals a function. We don't need to pass anything. And uh, so while this is happening, what we're going to do is we're going to have another object and this I call a sensor object. And its entire purpose is to have a mask. And that's about it. Like, it's just there to be a collision checker. It's a sensor. We're going to put it somewhere. We're going to stretch it and scale it and do all sorts of stuff with it. And then it's done. So for this guy, so let me create a new mask. So this is going to be a sprite mask. It's going to be a two by two. Uh, middle left. And I will I will show you why we picked those specific values in a little bit. Let's edit that image and we're gonna make this guy uh, pink. Okay, and we might come back and readjust this guy too. And then we're gonna say he's going to be rotated with rectangles. We're going to be like using this as like a sword that sweeps around us. So it's going to be rotated. 
Uh, so let's go back to player, sensor. Yeah, that's, this is all we need for sensor. Uh, so the idea is we're going to say, uh, first, do we have an instance of object sensor? If not instance exists object sensor, then we want to create one. We only really need one sensor object. And this is actually what's kind of cool about this. I talk about this in my rotated rectangle collision uh, tutorial. Just like we can swap masks as often as we want, we can share a single sensor object. And every object can say, hey, give me the sensor. Let me do a collision check with it and manipulate it and do whatever I want with it. And then it's just going to sit there until somebody else wants it. Uh, which is pretty cool. So, uh, so we're going to create an op, uh, an instance of it if it doesn't exist, and it doesn't matter even where we create it. We're just going to zero zero object sensor. Yeah, nothing about this matters because we're going to take full control over it in a minute and move it, stretch it, scale it, everything like that. Uh, okay, so. We've created an instance, and now since we know there's only ever one instance because we don't need more than one, we can just say object sensor dot x, whatever. Uh, so we're going to say object sensor dot x equals rx, object sensor dot y equals y, uh, ry. So we're pulling the sensor onto us. Uh, object sensor dot image x scale equals uh, how big do we want our, what's the radius we want on our, our weapon? right, uh, our sword. So let's say it's like 128. Uh, so rad equals 128. Uh, since our mask that we're using, our, our mask is two by two, and if you imagine we were to, zoom in on this, we were to grab this edge and just stretch it out, the scale would be at, at you know, a, an X scale of one, it's two pixels wide. An X scale of two, it's four pixels wide. An X scale of three, it's six pixels wide. So if we want it to match that radius exactly, we need to consider the width of this, uh, of this sprite, which is two. So we are going to say sword rad divided by sprite get width uh, uh, object sensor dot mask index. Okay, which reminds me, we need to tell object sensor which mask we want it to use. And in this case, it's right mask two by two, middle left. Uh, and we'll, we'll play with this and show you that you can swap this out for a different attack and a different mask and do it a little bit differently. Uh, okay, so we've got our X scale, uh, our Y scale. We'll leave Y scale alone for right now just make that one. Uh, we'll come back to that though. So this line I imagine is kind of blowing your mind a little bit uh, and that's okay. This, this is a little bit confusing and as always whenever I see logic like this it's just like wait what is that doing? I just like to plug in numbers. Okay so if sword rad is equal to 128 which is what we've got it set up above then our sprite get width of object sensor mask index is two. Uh, so uh, sprite width equals two, then 128 divided by two equals 64, right? So our image X scale is gonna be 64. We're multiplying the, the, the width of that, you know, we're stretching it out by 64 X and that's going to give us a sprite that is 128 pixels wide. Uh, so we'll be, you know, we might come back and we might make this our, you know, might resize this guy to be 32 by 32. And so if sword rad equals uh, 128 and sprite width equals 32, uh, what's 128 divided by 32? I should probably know this off the top of my head, but I don't. Is it four? Yeah, it's four. Uh, so uh, 128 divided by 32 equals 4. So our image x scale will equal 4. We're multiplying the side, the width of that. Uh, we're scaling that sprite 4 on the x-axis uh, to make it stretch out to 128. So 
it, it, it's a little mathy, but uh, very useful uh, so that we can make this mask whatever we want and it'll scale appropriately. Uh, okay, so we create this guy and he follows us. Uh, and that's about all he does. So we, this should be created and positioned and visible every time we click the space bar. So let's just see what that looks like now. Why isn't it working? Oh, right. Uh, we need to, let's, let's go into this guy real fast. Object sensor, uh, draw event. Since we're only setting his mask index, he's not gonna draw himself. Uh, so draw sprite mask index uh, zero and x, y. And uh, if mask index negative one, exit. So we don't wanna draw anything if his mask index is negative one. I don't know if that'll ever happen because as soon as we create him, we, we give him a mask index, so it should be fine. But just in case, there we go. So he is very small because I'm just doing a normal draw sprite. Let's fix that. We're gonna do x, image, x scale, image, y scale, image, angle, image, blend, and image, alpha. So that's our default drawing, basically. I mean, if we wanna get really technical, we could put image uh, index as well, but not necessary. So let's try that now. There we go. So we got a nice long line. Uh, it's very thin though. So let's go back to that, uh, that Y scale. We're gonna do the same thing. We want a sword thickness. And I don't know, I want it to be like 16 pixels thick. Same thing. Sword thickness divided by uh, sprite get height object sensor dot mask index. So we'll run that. There we go. And what's cool is we could say uh, image angle or object sensor image angle equals uh, random 360, right? Any, any direction. Okay, and these are actually gonna do collision checks. Like we could go, after doing that, we could say, hey, is there a bullet there? So we could just say, in fact, at this point, when you start seeing this, that's, uh, it's time to do a with. And then any of these guys, we just have to go other. Okay, so now we can just say uh, place uh, if, okay, let's look for a bullet. If bullet equals instance place. So this is going to move uh, our sensor object to a specific position, which we're just gonna use its current position and look for object bullet. And if it finds one, it's gonna put that instance ID inside a bullet for us. And we're gonna say if uh, bullet does not equal no one, so if it didn't collide with anybody, it's going to just return this keyword no one, which is technically negative four, but we'll use the, the keyword because it reads better. So if it didn't find anyone, so it found no one, uh, then we don't wanna do this. But if it did find something, then it would be not equal to no one. And we could say, uh, instance destroy bullet. So let's see if we can destroy a bullet. It's gonna be a little random, neat, random, but, oh, whoops. Uh, let's see, x equal, ah, there we go. Okay, so we're, there we go, there we go, getting lucky. On. There we go. Okay, so now we're using this guy. It's kind of stupid because it's just picking a random direction, but 
he is able to see and notice they can pass through him when I'm not using him. It only checks that first step when I tell it I'm pushing the keyboard button. I'm, I'm pushing the space bar, create it, use it, check for collision, destroy bullet. That only happens when I press VK space, right? I can make this a check, whatever, but it only lasts for one frame. So that that's just going to hang there forever until somebody else says, hey, I need another collision check. Move over here and do it for me. Uh, but we can make it a... Uh, a persistent thing. We can we can set like a swing timer and do like a cool animation to like spin it around and continue to check collision while it's going. So let's let's do this. Let's say start swipe bullets and then handle swipe in our step event. So and then. Actually, this is going to be our handle swipe. Is that what I call it? Handle swipe? No, it's just handle swipe. Let's say start swipe and handle swipe. How about that? So we're going to have some variables for this. We're going to have swipe, swiping. It's kind of a state variable is swiping equals false. Swipe timer equals zero. Swipe length equals. Uh, let's say we do it in a you know a, a, a frame, not a single second, sixty second or sixty frames, one second. Uh, so we'll say uh, is swiping equals true. Swipe timer equals zero, and that'll kick us off. So then, it handle swipe uh, timer would say. Uh, if not is swiping return, we don't want to do anything if we're not currently swiping. Uh, and then we'll increment our swipe timer. Timer equals uh, plus plus if swipe timer is greater than swipe length, then uh, is swiping equals false. Okay, and then otherwise, we are swiping. So we're going to make sure we got an object sensor. We're going to match our current X and Y. And then we, instead of an angle, we're going to set it to a lerp of 0 to 360. And uh, swipe timer divided by swipe length. So this is your standard lerp. Right, where it's just like I want to go between zero and 360, gonna get a percentage of swipe timer divided by swipe length. So let's math that out real fast again. It's like, hey, what's this code doing? Let's plug in the numbers with our understanding of LERP. So if if swipe timer equals zero and our swipe length equals uh, 60, then zero divided by 60 equals zero. So that's going to give us 0%. And the value 0% between 0 and 360 is zero, the, the, you know, the, our starting point. We are 0% progress from 0 to 360 is zero. We haven't even started yet. So then the other side of that is swipe timer equals 60, swipe length equals 60. And which means we're going to calculate 60 divided by 60, which equals 1, which gives us 100%. So we have traveled from 0 to 360. The value we find at the end is 360. So that's the angle we're going to be using. And then you can plug this in. You know, What if our swipe timer is 30? Well, that's uh, 30 divided by 60, which is 0.5, which is 50%, which is 180. You know, So we're going to progress through all of those as swipe timer increments up here, we're going to keep rotating around from 0 to 360. And we'll do something cool with this in a little bit using twerp. Uh, so as we rotate, we're going to continue checking for collisions. If we find one, we're going to uh, destroy it. Chances of this working, slim, but we'll try it. 
there we go, swipe timer. Oh, right. So uh, this sort of stuff is all handled on the other side. Okay, that should do it. So those belong to the object, not to the sensor. There we go. And that'll just stay there. It doesn't actually do anything, but okay. It's pretty, uh, so it actually follows us. And we can kind of sweep it up. So pretty cool. Uh, it's kind of stupid looking, but it works and it's really slow. So let's like, let's like kick this up. There you go. It's kind of cool. Now, you might notice that there's a bit of a gap, right? Like if I made this really, really fast, then there's a chance that it might not, uh, uh, it might kind of squeak through. Like if I made this so it only, if it was like, let's see, what would I have to do? Uh, if the length was like four, right? That's, that's four checks before it's done. Uh, and I don't even know if you'll be able to see this on the capture. But yeah, we're basically only getting cardinal directions, right? And yeah, that's not going to catch anybody who's diagonal. And it, so if you want something to go that fast and catch everything in between, you're probably better off using a different method, which we'll actually get to in a second. So this is, we're doing it this way so that we have that cool like animation and that things actually disappear when they get contacted and not necessarily just because they're within range. Uh, so I'm going to bring in the scripts, twerp, bring in twerp, do this, this will be cool. And since we use lerp, we can swap it out for twerp easy enough. And we're going to use twerp type dot in out back, just to make this look a little cooler. To be honest, I'm not sure why it ends up over on the left side afterwards, but it's probably not a big deal. I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, I doubt it's actually checking collision uh, when it gets over, no, it, should, it would be. Why does it flip all the way over to the, oh, because we increment swipe timer up here. Uh, let's, so let's do this down here. There we go. That'll make it a little bit more accurate. I thought. something wrong with twerp on this? It's possible, but unlikely. Okay, maybe there is a bug within Outback. That's too bad. I need to fix that. Uh, we'll just do uh, Outback. That should work fine, right? Yeah, that looks fun. So, still pretty fast, so you can see it kind of things squeak by. So, it's uh, a little quick. So, we can speed that, slow that down a little bit by changing the swipe length. There we go. Okay, so let's do one other thing, and that is, so you can use the, the sensor concept for literally anything, right? You could have a fighting game character that uh, every time it does an attack, it, cre it uses one sensor object to check 15 different hitboxes for its foot, its fist, its, you know, its back 
fist so it could hit things behind it, anything. Uh, and there's no downside. There's no way to screw it up. You just say, hey, with this, go here, move to this position, change the side, change this rotation, check for collision, move on, uh, or do whatever you need to do with it and then move on. Uh, so let's build another, uh, another action. So if mouse check button pressed and be left, I should have done should have done left and right pressed anyway. So let's say MB left and, and this will be MB right. We're just gonna burst, similar to what we were doing before, we're just gonna uh, do a circle burst uh, to clear bullets. So, let's function and this is going to be very similar. Uh, in fact, you'll probably want to, you know, we functionize this because we're we're doing it twice. Uh, so circle burst. So we create an instance of object sensor if it doesn't exist. With it, we're not going to use sprite mask 2x2 middle left anymore. We're going to use sprite mask, uh, you know what, uh, bullet. Uh, let's see. Nice circle, it's circular, it's centered, uh, and we're gonna use the same logic for our burst radius. So uh, burst rad equals 128, similar to our sword rad. And we're just gonna drop that in here. So our X and our Y scale are both based on sword rad. Image angle, we actually don't need, so we just set that back to zero. Uh, and then any place meeting, we're good. So now we should be able to swap back and forth between two different types. It's the same object, right? There's just one sensor object. So that's one, and this is the same one. And if I click there, that's gone. Click there, that's gone. Now, the last thing we probably need to talk about is that that just, destroyed one bullet. That just destroyed one bullet. We're not getting all of the bullets, right? We're just getting the one. And that's that's not good, right? I mean, that would, that would, that would happen with this guy as well. It's just a lot less likely because we're doing so many different collision checks over the, the, the animation, right? Every frame of the animation, we're clearing it. But that guy got through, right? So it's possible. And this is a big problem with hitboxes where it's like an explosion, an area of effect where you are capable of hitting more than one object at the same time. Uh, so how do we fix that? Uh, it kind of sucks, to be perfectly honest, because we can't just use instance place because this is always going to return just one bullet, right? No matter, we can collide with 100, it's still only going to give us one. So... Let's do this. Uh, let's uh, change it from instance place to instance place list. So uh, X, Y, object bullet, and then we need a list. So this is one of the few places that I still use data structures. Uh, in fact, I think it's like the only place that I still use data structures. So we need to create a list because that's how this works. Create a list, throw it in here. We don't need it ordered, so we can just set that to false. And then, you know, by the time we're done, we want to destroy the list. We don't need the list anymore. So always, when you do use data structures, you always want to write the create and the deletion in pairs if you can. Uh, oh, no, sorry. Destroy. Delete will just remove an item from the list. We want to destroy it completely so we don't get a memory leak. So this isn't going to return anything. It's just going to populate our list for us. So we say list. So then we can just say if uh, ds list size. Uh, you know, we don't even need to check it. We just do a for loop. So we'll get back a list of bullets. Uh, so we'll say for var i 
equals zero. I is less than ps list size list i plus plus. So what if we didn't get any uh, bullets back? Then the list would be zero. So I would not be less than zero. So we wouldn't execute this at all. So we're just going to uh, only execute this if there's anything in our list. So we don't need an if check. We don't need to say if ds list size list is greater than uh, zero because we're already doing that. We're just saying only do that if i, which is zero, is less than ds list size. And if ds list size is also zero, i zero is not less than zero. It's equal to zero, so we don't do anything. So we don't need that. So we need to figure out what is our bullet. Our bullet isn't bullet anymore because we don't have that variable. It's going to be an item in a list. So we're going to do list. And you access a list similar to an array. So this should look familiar. But since it's a list and not an array, we need to put a pipe character right there. Uh, that's, that's telling us that this is a, a list, a DS list, and not, not a, a, an array. So there's a, a list accessor is what this, call, this is called. Again, I only use lists for specifically working with the instance place uh, list uh, function. And I've written my own version of this. It says instance place array. Still uses a list, but uh, it'll return an array instead, which is kind of handy. Uh, so, so this will go through and destroy all the bullets that the, uh, uh, the sensor detected underneath it. So let's go back here real fast and just say, you know what, instead of, let's make this a little uh, easier to see. How about that? Let's see the things behind it. Uh, all right, let's run that. And let's see if our burst is capable of, oh, I forgot something. Oh, whoops. Let's see if our burst is capable of taking out multiple bullets now. Okay, so there's our burst. Boom. Okay, let's get these two together. So let's wait for a whole bunch in the center. Boom. Yep, so it took them all out. Now, what's kind of interesting is that we can do both of these at the same time. I can start a swipe and uh, a burst at the same time. You just won't be able to see it because we're changing the mask so fast that I would have to slow down the swipe a lot so that you could see I can interrupt the, the swipe. Uh, so let's say if our swipe length is like 300, so it takes like five seconds. I should be able to start a swipe, right click to do a burst and kill bullets that the swipe hasn't gone through yet because you know you don't see it. See, so do that again. So I'll kill the one on to the left of me by starting a swipe. And then in fact, I can just keep going. So we're doing both checks at the quote unquote the same time because nothing happens at the same time. We're going through and we're saying uh, in our step event, we're saying, hey, go ahead and do a burst, which will clear out the, uh, uh, which will swap our sensors to a bullet, size, do the collision check, destroy bullets, and then handle swipe, which will, again, grab our sensor object, change the sprite and, or the mask, and then do collision checks. So that's why when I interrupt it, it always looks, the sprite doesn't change from the pink sword thing because that's the last thing we do is, the pink sword thing instead of the circle thing. So if we're if we're swiping, it's always going to look like a swipe, but we can still do this at the same time. And if we had two different graphical effects to go with this, so there's like a kind of a radiating burst effect uh, and a the sword swipe effect, they could be played at the same time visually. The collision checks could still uh, you know, be done simultaneously uh, in the same step. And we're, and we're still doing the other things too, checking for wall collisions, checking for bullet collisions. So that's four different, completely different collision checks, uh, all done in a single step, every single step, uh, by just messing with masks and using separate objects to go out and test things for us. 
and different collision mass. So in this way, you can cover, basically there's no collision check thing you can't do. There's no combination of hitboxes and complicated shapes and number of objects and uh, that you can't do with all of these different principles. So hopefully that was helpful and not too meandering. Let me know if you have any questions.